design. And what this, this, you know, you have to realize that all these experiments that we talked about in the, the papers that are written, not one of the experiments, even in the best science journals, are perfect. Okay? And so this wasn't perfect because it was hard to, I mean, I couldn't teach that, that many classes and have that many students. And so we did it in the best way possible. I also uh, uh, um, uh, don't uh, uh, support or that, that conclusion is not strongly supported because just general learning in universities, uh, in university classes, are not changing your cognition. You're certainly learning stuff, I hope. Um, uh, but there's not uh, strong evidence that there's changes in cognition just because you happen to take a particular class. But there's more evidence that change in cognition can be seen with exercise. So, um, uh, uh, but still an important concern. Um, but what I really wanted to get at uh, um, with the discussion of that, um, uh, of that experiment is that I am at the very beginning of this new research area, trying to understand the brain basis of how exercise may or may not change your cognition. So I started with basically a psychology experiment, a behavioral experiment. Can I see cognitive changes in my students if I make them exercise more? And I have preliminary data that the answer is yes. But now, and what we kind of got at at the end of, of the class uh, that I want to just focus on more, because this is kind of, again, a wrapping up of what we've been trying to learn, what we've been trying to figure out, which is what are the brain changes that might underlie these, these um, cognitive changes that I did see in my class that exercise versus a class that didn't exercise, okay? And so this is, you know, what, what neuroscientists, what scientists think about. And so I want you to be able to appreciate that now you're able to understand and come up with some hypotheses. So what are some hypotheses about things that could change in the brain that might underlie this, this uh, behavioral change that we see? Okay? Given the fact it might be because one teacher was different than the other, it might be because of exercise, the fact is you see a change in cognition. So again, we talked about it a little bit at the end of the course, but this is a key <coughs> question because it makes you go back and think about all the different things as a neuroscientist you might go back and look at. So what are some of those things? Let's start from the beginning. We started with synaptic transmission. Could that be changed? Could that be different in students that exercise versus not students that exercise? Yes or no? Yes, okay. So how might you study that? Any ideas? How would, you how would you study a change in synapse function? Did we, did we talk about a paradigm that you do see changes in synaptic uh, uh, um, uh, plasticity? Sorry? Say, say one more time. Hebb's law. Hebb's law. law, right. So what was the um, paradigm that we looked at to be uh, to show uh, a real example, a possible example of Hebb's law? We talked about plastic. Uh, so I'm talking about a cellular example of Hebb's law. Yes. Right. So there was the sea slug, the aplasia, where we saw habituation, short-term habituation, and long-term habituation. But what about in an animal with a hippocampus? Yes. BDNF could change. So that's another thing that you can look at in these, in these subjects. But I'm looking for a mammalian example of cellular plasticity, synaptic plasticity, that you might be able to look at in subjects that exercise. Yes. The rats. Okay. How? What? What exactly would you look at? There is one big important concept that we talked about: changes in synaptic plasticity in the hippocampus. Yes. 
Neurogenesis is another example, so that, that could change synaptic plastic. That is a change in number of neurons there, but I'm talking about an example. LTP, thank you, long-term potentiation. So that is uh, uh, present in the hippocampus of mammals. So, you know, I couldn't study LTP in my students because I would have to take their hippocampi out and they need them right now. So uh, that, we can't do that. But if I made rats exercise, for example, so let's just imagine I did the same experiment with rats. I, I made them exercise, and then instead of teaching them about um, uh, the, uh, uh, the effects of exercise on the brain, I made them do some sort of cognitive test. I made them do a spatial memory test, and I, I really worked their hippocampus. And I saw that they got better at hippocampal dependent tasks. So I would really want to look at their synaptic transmission. Looking at LTP, is LTP stronger in them or not? I want to look at BDNF. I want to see whether BDNF has, has increased. I want to look at, um, uh, well, the, the aplasia example that was given is another example that's, that's uh, uh, a slightly different system, but same kind of idea. Anything else? that you want to look at in these rat models now that have exercise and show better cognitive performance. I'm just using rats now for an example because you can use them in experiments in much more direct ways than you can use humans. Any other examples from all the different things that we talked about over class? Cellular examples, uh, brain, brain area examples. What part of the brain would you look at in, in these animals? Yes? <coughs> Cortical thickness, you can absolutely look at cortical thickness. Um, you can look at hippocampal size. I talked about studies in humans where if they exercise, the elderly people that exercise for a whole year, actually their hippocampi got bigger compared to age match controls. Um, anything else that comes to mind from all the things that we talked about? Okay, so this is a really important uh, example for you to think about because it's it's uh, that's why we end with this part of the class because with these global kind of more cognitive questions we can then go back and and think about all the different paradigms and all of the different scenarios that we've learned about through the semester and have you start to come up with actual experiments that you might do and hypotheses why are you going to look at BDNF? Well, other studies have shown that BDNF is important for plasticity. So I would want to measure BDNF. And we talk about the fact that you can measure BDNF in saliva. So you might even be able to do it in humans. Okay? So this is what I'm talking about. Thinking like a scientist that is using all the information that we've, we've gradually accrued over this whole semester long uh, um, uh, journey together and uh, trying to start to answer new questions. Maybe you might uh, notice that uh, exercise enhances your cognition, or when you get better sleep, that it enhances your cognition. You will now be able to kind of think about how one might be able to study that as a neuroscientist. So I just want you to appreciate that. And these are the kinds of questions that we're definitely going to be asking you as part of this 60% uh, um, um, of the uh, final exam that we'll be focusing on uh, this last part of the, um, of the uh, uh, coursework after the last exam. Okay, so today I want to move on to executive functions and the prefrontal cortex. And we start here with a uh, historical example uh, of a very famous um, neurological patient. Has anybody heard of Phineas Gage? Okay, great. So you'll know that he was a manager in a, um, uh, a train railroad construction company. He was working uh, here on the East Coast. And he was um, uh, apparently uh, tamping down uh, a, an explosive area. And he was using this uh, special tamping rod, just a big old rod, uh, to do that, to get it nice and flat before um, an explosion, a, a um, uh, kind of controlled explosion was to take place. So he knew there was dynamite underneath there, and he was using this big old rod and tamping it down. And unfortunately, the rod was made of metal. And there was uh, the, the metal rod uh, hit a rock and caused a little spark, which ignited the dynamite underneath the dirt that he was actually tamping down. And the rod went up 
through his skull. And you can see his skull right here. And the rod actually went in underneath his cheek here, back behind his left eye, and came up here. This is a reconstruction of what happened. And it went all the way through. It exploded all the way out. But what was amazing is that after about a minute, he sat back up. And he was able, with a little bit of help, to actually walk to the doctor to get his two big holes in his head cleaned up. Here is uh, just an actual picture of the skull itself. And um, uh, he, was, he was actually able to talk to the doctor. And so for some reason, um, he was able to survive this um, terrible, terrible accident. But you can see, this is uh, a MRI reconstruction of the pathway of this tamping rod. Um, so you can show what parts of the brain it, uh, uh, were affected. This is uh, the most anterior part of your brain, uh, the most anterior part of the frontal lobe, called the prefrontal cortex. And so what this case shows us is what this area of the brain might be responsible for. So certainly uh, it was clear the, that uh, Phineas Gage um, uh, recovered from this. But the result of this, once he was able to recover from uh, the actual wounds, was the quote that was given by his friends, was Gage was no longer Gage. So he tried to go back to work as a manager. He was actually known as a very meticulous, excellent manager of people. He kept things in order. He was able to manage people and tell them what to do to get the job done quickly and efficiently. He turned into a complete um, disorganized mess. He was not able to get his job done. He, um, while he was known as a very you know, mild-mannered uh, kind of guy, he started swearing all over the place. He started gambling. He couldn't hold down his job anymore. Um, he started drinking. He would go through these mood swings where sometimes he would be very, very withdrawn, and other times he would be completely manic. So that's what I mean by Gage was no longer Gage. If they were able to test his general IQ, his IQ would be identical to, or very, very similar to what it was before the accident. Just like HM's IQ actually got a little bit better because he wasn't suffering so much from these debilitating uh, epileptic seizures. Um, but so many parts of his life, his age, his ability to keep things in order, to do things in a, a ordered way, uh, were, uh, were completely uh, damaged by this damage that he received in the prefrontal cortex. So what are the major functions of the prefrontal cortex that we're going to be talking about today? There's two that we'll focus on. One, uh, one emotional, and emotional not exactly in the same way as um, the uh, amygdala has been implicated in emotion. So now we have two areas important in emotional processing. Amygdala, particularly studied in fear. Um, uh, patients with amygdala damage can't recognize different uh, emotions on faces. Um, but prefrontal cortex uh, uh, damage has um, perhaps more global or more subtle effects. People with prefrontal damage um, have a hard time recognizing social cues. So you know when you don't want to talk to anybody anymore, and you kind of start backing away, and you start looking at your cell phone, and you start going away? Somebody with a prefrontal lesion will not recognize those kinds of signs. Now you might think that some of your friends have prefrontal lesions from that example, but, but uh, this, is, this is much more pronounced. Uh, and so they're not able, in a statistical way, to read major kind of social signs that most of us would, would, uh, um, would take. So um, emotion is one of the reasons, and what I'm using for evidence for this is also the fact that his emotional state was so volatile after uh, this damage, um, uh, going from manic to uh, withdrawal. In fact, uh, the more common 
uh, effect of prefrontal damage is very withdrawn, very blunted uh, emotional um, uh, um, expression uh, with prefrontal damage. Uh, but you can get manic activity as well. So that's the emotion. Now I want to spend the most part of uh, uh, the rest of today's session talking about the different cognitive effects of um, prefrontal damage. And so here again, we're kind of at the same point we were with patient HM. So with patient HM, you had this experimental surgery, damage of the medial temporal lobe area that caused this, this striking, this devastating um, memory impairment that seemed very specific for memory. And then we talked about all the experiments that, that went on to study this. The, the lesion experiments in animals that helps define which areas were involved. And we're at the same point here. Now we have some clues from Phineas Gage and his, his uh, observation that Gage was no longer Gage to try and glean what these areas are doing. We're going to go one step further here, not just looking at lesion studies, but looking at um, what we'll call behavioral neurophysiology. This is something new. And um, so this is kind of the new thing that we're going to be covering today. So cognition. Before I go into cognition, I just want to give you a little uh, uh, primer on the anatomy of the frontal lobe. So the whole frontal lobe is before, is anterior to the central sulcus. Remember, just posterior to the central cort sulcus is primary somatosensory cortex, S1. Primary somatosensory cortex. Does anybody remember what's just anterior to the central sulcus? What brain area is just anterior to the central sulcus? Yes. Primary motor cortex. So right before that. So that means primary motor cortex and um, secondary motor areas that are just in front of that are part of the frontal lobe, since the frontal lobe is defined as anything anterior to the central sulcus. So, um, uh, uh, but in front of the major uh, primary and secondary motor areas is the area called prefrontal cortex. And that's what we'll be focusing on today. So the frontal cortex in general includes these motor areas together with these emotional and cognitive areas. But if we focus on prefrontal cortex, you uh, really have more of a focus on the emotional and cognitive components that we'll talk about today. Okay? Now, um, the other thing that I want to point out is the relative difference in size, specifically of the prefrontal cortex, these more cognitive, emotional areas, in different species. So here is a squirrel monkey. Um, it's a smaller, smaller kind of monkey. A cat, tiny. Rhesus monkey has a little bit bigger. Uh, prefrontal area relative to the rest of the brain. Chimpanzee, pretty big. But the main point I make with this side that is shown in your book, that's been emphasized in your book, is that um, the human has the largest relative size of the prefrontal cortex of all animal species. Again, just defined by um, uh, how I defined it, in front of uh, the secondary motor areas. So, uh, humans, Whatever function up is up here is very, very well uh, um, um, uh, um, um, developed uh, compared to other species. Um, oh, I also want to remind you, we talked about something at the very beginning of class, and that is frontal lobotomies. Remember, frontal lobotomies were part of this psychosurgery that was done in the 1950s. Um, if you really want to figure yourself out, you can go on YouTube and look at examples of frontal lobotomies. Um, and these were done to try and help cure uh, schizophrenic patients. Um, and they, they really blunted emotion. Remember I told you frontal lobe lesions were blunting of um, emotions. So what they did, basically, is you see this is uh, um, patient, um, oh, sorry, not patient, but Phineas Gage's lesions. What they do is they go through the eye socket. They, they don't do this anymore. But they went through the eye socket with a little um, switch blade and just made, made a cut right behind us in the frontal lobe, cutting off the connections between the frontal lobe and the rest of the brain. This was in patients that had um, schizophrenia, that had um, severe manic depressive disorders, where they were very, very disruptive. 
And you know what? It did blunt their emotions. They were not nearly as aggressive as before. But you, you completely removed their personality in the same way that Gage was no longer Gage. You're removing their personality. So we want to try and understand what we understand now about the functions of these areas that, that put our personalities up in the frontal lobe. So the first major um, kind of studyable kind of uh, result or uh, cognitive function uh, that was defined in the frontal lobe uh, was um, a function called working memory. And before I define that for you, I just want to describe for you the task on which it was, um, uh, it was identified. So this is a delayed response task. And this is the same kind of task that um, was, uh, uh, this is related to the delayed non-matching to sample task that we talked about in the medial temporal lobe um, uh, section. Um, and this is uh, how it was done. So monkeys are sitting in front of a, um, uh, a tray. Uh, the tray has two different, um, um, two different uh, holes in front of it. And what you do is you show the animal a food morsel, usually a raisin or a peanut or an M&M, they like those. And then you put the food in one of the containers and then you cover it with two identical covers, just uh, little, little square plaques. And once you cover it, then you, give, you, you uh, shut the animal's door so he doesn't have access to this for a very short time. And then you raise it up again, you give him the opportunity to, to find the morsel. You haven't done any bad tricks, you haven't changed it. But you do this over and over and over again so that there's a lot of interference between, wait, was it this one or that one? Because I've been seeing either the right or the left so many times. This is an animal that's, uh, that's hungry, so he's motivated to see it. What we see, this simple task, monkeys can do. They can learn how to do it, no problem at all. But even with a very, very short delay interval, People uh, early on found that even very, very small selective lesions of one part of the prefrontal cortex called the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. It is, here's the lateral prefrontal cortex. Dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is, is right in here. Even a very small portion. Uh, these early studies were done actually in chimps. Um, you can um, uh, get a severe impairment of the ability to perform this simple task with just a short delay interval. Okay, so let me make sure, I want you to understand this task, because we're going to con compare and contrast this task with, um, uh, with our delayed non-matching the sample task, okay? So all it is, is there's two holes here, and I'll put a food morsel here, and I'll cover it, and then after just, you know, you have to close your eyes for two seconds, open your eyes again, you have to tell me which food well you want to choose. Choose this one, because I put it in. But then on the next trial, I might put it in this one, this trial, next trial, I might put it in this one again, then this one. And um, so there's a lot of interference there. There is an impairment. You now choose by chance, even after just a very short delay interval. So tell me, think about this task for a second. Why would you fail this task? What would be some reasons why you would fail this simple task? Thinking about what you might have to do to perform this task. Any ideas? So this is what neuropsychologists did. They, uh, they did a very, very simple task, and they found this striking deficit. Now they have to figure out what, what might be wrong. There could be lots of things wrong. What do you think? What, what could make somebody fail? at this task. Yes? Um, that specific part of the brain could be part where it stores very short memories like Very good. So that particular part of the brain could be the part that stores very short-term memories, even after a few seconds. So you need that part to keep something in mind. Great. Any other ideas? Did you have another, did you have another thought? No. Any other ideas? What, what if my poor little monkey just didn't understand the rules? Would that cause him to not perform well? Yes or no? Yes, okay. 
So there are lots of reasons. Any, anybody else can come up with anything to, I mean, you, you do really badly at tasks. He was up, he was blind. Okay, but that's a good reason. Maybe he was blind, maybe he didn't have a visual cortex. Lots and lots of reasons, yes. Yeah. Um, also perhaps that part of the brain works in decision making, the monkey not really know, not knowing which one to choose. Right, very good. So she says maybe that part of the brain that was damaged uh, has important things to do with decision making. Maybe he knows it, or, but he just can't make his final decision. Maybe he can't see it. Maybe he's not hungry because, you know, the part of the brain important for appetite has been damaged. Maybe he can't move his arm because you damaged his arm part of the brain. That's not true. All these things, other things can be controlled for. So it turns out that um, it's not specific decision making, but that's an excellent uh, point. Uh, excellent possibility. It's not motor problems, we can test that. It's not vision problems, we can test that. It's not not liking the food or not being able to choose food because there's other tasks that it does perfectly well. What it turns out to be is uh, exactly what our first uh, um, responder said, that it's the animal can't hold things in mind for a short time. Now think about this, holding things in mind do you do that a lot? Yes? Okay, tell me an example of when you hold things in mind. What do you do when you hold things in mind? Yeah, what are you doing? So when you meet someone and they tell you their name, you, I repeat it okay. over and over in my head. Okay, great. When you meet somebody and they tell you your, their name, and you don't want to look like a schmuck and not know their name, and he says he repeats it all the time, perfect. That is easy perfect example of what's called working memory, keeping things in mind. Any Anything else that you're doing? Yes? When people ask you a question, have to keep their question in mind? Right. Keep their question in mind. If they ask you two in a row, then that's even harder. So yeah, that's an excellent example. Yes? Yes. When you go into the room and you can't remember why you came into the room to get something, that is an example of failure of working memory. Yes? When somebody tells you directions, perfect. Uh, a, a great example. Any Anything else? What about games that you play? Yes? So like a phone number? A phone number. That's a classic example of working memory. And um, so, you know, you have to get the phone number and it's not in your phone, you have to remember it. That's, that's about at the limit. We, we can remember about seven items at a time. And that is memory through, through this working memory, keeping in mind. It's also called mental scratch pad memory. You're using it all the time. You are all using it right now to try and keep the things that I said at the beginning of the class in mind so you can, you can build on it for the rest of the class. That's how I design my lectures, assuming that you all have great both working memory. Sometimes by the end of the class, we're getting back to long-term memory. I'm asking you to go back and remember what the delayed non-match of the sample task is. That's long-term memory. So you're using this in every class, not just my class, you're using this uh, mixture of working memory and long-term memory all the time. So this is not some weird, you know, esoteric kind of thing. It's not like sensitization in the C slide where you think, oh, that has nothing to do with me, even though it does, the molecular aspects absolutely do. This is a function that is used all the time. It's a critical, um, it's a critical uh, cognitive function. So think about this for a second. What if you weren't able to do that? What would your life be like? Do you think if you had a terrible memory and every time you went into a room you couldn't remember what the heck you were uh, you were going into the room for, but you still had your long-term memory so you could remember the things that you've learned before. What do you think that would be like? Can anybody give any examples of what how that would change the way that they that they go to school and they they live that you're living right now as students? Notebooks. You can you would buy a lot of notebooks. That's a good, a good, good answer. Yes, yes. Okay. Wouldn't be able to get dressed in the morning because you walk in and out of the room, forgetting your socks and forgetting, you know, your shirt and these other things. Exactly. And that's exactly why Phineas Gage lost his job 
after the prefrontal damage. He was no longer able to be a manager. What do you need to do to be a manager? You need to keep these things in mind, okay? Was there a, a question over here, or an example over here? No? Okay, great. So that, that's a perfect example. We're talking about a fundamental cognitive function that was first, yes? No, that's a really good question. We're going to actually talk about that at the end of the class. The answer is no. Why do you think I said no? What's the difference between this deficit and HM's core deficit? Yes? Well, HM couldn't create any new memories, whereas, like, Kenny's age would probably, if he met someone over and over, he'd remember them. Yes. It would be long term, but he couldn't just remember a phone number. Perfect, perfect. So Phineas Gage can't remember short-term things, but he can still create new long-term memories. So if you met somebody over and over, they, you would remember him. But you know, you may have weird social interactions with them. They won't, may not want to know you anymore, but you would remember them. So very, very different. And uh, conversely, HM could have a perfectly normal conversation and even remember your, your name short-term if he practiced it in mind. But Five, ten minutes later, he'd be like, we've never met, right? So that's very, very different um, uh, things. But both, obviously, critical cognitive functions. You need both your medial temporal lobe and prefrontal cortex to function, particularly when you're students. Okay, so here is a, uh, uh, just a reminder of this other key task, delayed non-matching the sample task where uh, you sh you're shown a sample stimulus, and then there's a difference between a sample stimulus and a novel stimulus. Now, one point that I want to make that's very important is the amount of interference in this delayed response test. There's only two wells. And so you're getting, when you're doing this task for whatever, 50, 100 trials, it's like, I can't, I can't remember, because was it this one on that time? I've seen them so many different times. It's like going, I don't know if you go to the gym, and you go to the same gym all the time, I go to the same gym all the time, and you go and you put your things in a locker, and you can't remember where you put it in, I guess it's the same as parking, but nobody has a car here, so we go to the gym instead. Um, I can't remember which, which locker I went to this time, because I've been into this gym so many times, and I've put my stuff in so many different lockers, I have to parse out what that is. That is part, and I'm using, um, well, that's partially long-term memory, but uh, the, the idea of interference being high is the same with that example. Here, we are using uh, low interference items because I'm using different stimuli on every single task. So I'm asking you to remember a sample stimulus for, for example, the longest delay, a 10-minute delay that really taps medial temporal lobe function. So if you have a medial temporal lobe deficit um, or a lesion, especially a small lesion, you're fine with the short delays. But once I start taxing you, both with multiple sample stimuli and with long delay intervals between the sample and the choice, that's when you start getting uh, impaired with a medial temporal lobe lesion. Okay? Now, would somebody with, uh, with an, would a monkey with a prefrontal lesion be impaired on this task? on this task with long delay intervals? Yes? You think so? Who, any, does everybody agree? Why do you think, why do you think you'd be in here? So what he said is he thinks that, that his um, uh, 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 opinion is that animals with prefrontal lesions would be impaired on this task because uh, to keep things, to be able to perform this task with a 10 minute delay, you have to keep it in mind. That is a totally reasonable idea. Uh, but the, the fact is that um, once you get out to a 10 minute delay, um, you're actually not practicing it in mind. So you're not, you could, and if you did that with a prefrontal lesion uh, or with a, uh, yeah, you might be able to do that. But what happens is when the delay is longer, you move from a strategy of just your working memory is working, keeping things in mind naturally, to uh, a situation where your medial temporal lobe gets engaged. 
because it's a situation where you can't keep things in mind. So a perfect example is patient HM. So patient HM could remember my name if I told him my name because he's, he's like you. He practices my name. He says it all the time during the conversation because he knows that he has a bad memory. So he says it all the time. But once I distract him, and that's the distraction is like this, this longer, longest delay, especially for animals uh, that don't have as long a, um, uh, a memory span as we do, that really shifts into what the medial temporal lobe is important for. So you just have to know that the, media, the, the frontal lobe is um, important for shorter intervals of keeping things in mind. But once you get to longer delays, um, you start to engage the medial temporal lobe because uh, the, you simply can't keep things in mind all for, for that long. That's not, uh, that's, uh, um, you start to, to uh, rely then on the medial temporal lobe, but that's an excellent um, uh, possible response. Okay, so now we have this classic task, um, delayed response. Uh, we're seeing a really, really striking deficit with very short delay intervals with a very selective lesion in part of the prefrontal cortex, okay? It happens to be dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Here it is in the monkey. Here's, here's the uh, name in the small type. Dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, okay? So from our medial temporal lobe uh, uh, um, um, uh, section, we lesion this, we got the steps in, aha, it must be important for um, working memory. The question is how? What exactly are these cells doing to allow working memory to happen? Now we asked that same question in the medial temporal lobe, and we kind of jumped to a much more cellular uh, uh, level, uh, level of understanding with LTP. So we said, how can we remember all these things? Well, there's LTP in uh, the hippocampus. So that, that is involved. Here, we're able to go in and um, actually ask the question in a much more uh, direct way, or we're asking the question here in a much more direct way. How are we going to do this? We're going to record the activity of individual cells in this key part, but this tiny kind of little lesion causes this massive impairment, specifically on this task. We're going to record and ask what the cells are doing on a task that's very similar to this, but not identical, okay? And what we see is these, act, these cells are really active during that delay interval where the animals must keep things in mind. This is the delay interval where uh, presumably the animals with lesions are forgetting where, uh, where that stimulus was. So let's see how that works. Here is the task that uh, has been used to study um, the activity of these individual cells in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. It's called the ocular motor delayed response class. Task. Sorry, I should have written that out. Ocular motor delayed response task. It's actually written in the um, figure legend. So how does this work? Here we don't have um, just two wells. We have eight possible positions. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, eight possible positions. And here's how the task works. The monkey, this is a computer monitor. The animal sitting there. He uh, first has been taught to fixate on the central fixation point. And then, um, at a certain time, uh, a Q stimulus is shown. Q stimulus is shown to the left. He maintains fixation. During the delay interval, he has to maintain fixation, but the Q stimulus disappears. And then, um, uh, when he's given a signal that is this Q stimulus disappears, sorry, the, uh, the fixation spot disappears, that's his cue to make an eye movement to the location where the Q was shown. Okay, so he has to keep in mind where that cue was and make a psychotic eye movement to that location. So presumably, at this delay interval, he's thinking, okay, it's on the left, 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 and then when the cue, uh, when the fixation spot disappears, he makes his eye movement there, okay? So we can look at activity during the cue period, during the delay period, and during the response period. Here, we're looking at um, the uh, eye traces and how precise the dots are the location of the trace when, um, first when the actual dot is there, so the animals can maintain fixation at very particular points if they have a target, 
And here is how precise they are if there is a three second delay between the cue and the response. So here, there's no target, but they're just going to the spot they remember. It's, it's, you know, it's a little bit worse, but not so bad. And it gets a little bit messier when the delay is six seconds long. So they're able to do it at a behavioral level, so they're able to do this task. Does everybody see how it's similar to this task? Any questions about that? Yes. How, how do you get the animal to fixate on a cue and respond to that kind of cue? Uh, it's very simple. So you use something the animal really likes. Turns out animals really like food juice. Okay? And so you, um, uh, you uh, get him at a point of day when he hasn't drunk a lot and he's, he's thirsty. And you find his favorite fruit juice. And what you do is something very simple. First, you put him in a dark room. And then you shine a big white circle on the computer screen. And naturally, what do you do? You look at it. And when he does that, you give him a big, big score of juice. Okay? And then you do that again, and you teach him that every time he looks at that dot, he gets a big spot of fruit juice. And then you make the dot smaller and smaller and smaller until he's staring at it. So he could, you know, suck out as much fruit juice as he wants. And that's how you get them to um, um, first fix it. And then what you do is you um, teach them that the cue is good too. So then, you, uh, um, what you can do in training is now you first taught them to fix it. So they know that once that dot is out there, it's a specific color dot, and you always use it all the time, that they have to keep their eyes open. Then you can teach them to fixate longer and longer, right? So it's not just once you're caught, but you have to stay there first for 200 milliseconds, then 400 milliseconds to get the same juice, and you could increase the juice because it's harder and harder. But then what you can do is, uh, once they should say, here, you remove that and put a big square someplace else. They say, oh, well, maybe I'll try and fix it there. And you do that, and you give huge juice. OK, that's good. So, so it's like the same way you would uh, motivate a student to do a task for you. You give them $25. If I give you $25, will you come do my task? Yeah, I'll go do your task. Same kind of motivation, except monkeys use a currency of uh, fruit juice. So um, this is the task. They can learn it uh, um, just with this kind of shaping. And they can perform the eye movement task quite well, even after a delay. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that this is a very nice and clear uh, um, variation of the same delayed response task. So it's just a delay. Here's the delay here. And you have to go where, uh, with no cue, you have to go to where the response is. And here, here's the cue first. And then we give a delay. And then they have to go to where the cue is. And the reward isn't there. But once they uh, attain this spot, they get the fruit juice squirted into their mouth. OK? So that, that is the task. And now we're going to look at the pattern of neural activity in, uh, during the cue period, during the delay period, and during the response period. And I'm going to show you how many action potentials, how many spikes that you see in these individually isolated prefrontal neurons during cue, delay, and response. So here is um, the activity. And let's just look at this. Um, uh, raster plot right here. So here on the horizontal lines are individual trials, and each one of these tick marks is an individual spike. So here's trial one, two, three, four, five, and down here I've averaged all of the uh, responses over time. This is the um, uh, this is the fixation period here. Between these two lines is the cue presentation period. Between here and here is the delay period, and here is the response, OK? And so what we're looking at here is the activity during trials in which the south target was shown. So here is um, fi uh, fixation. Here is south target being shown. Here's delay, and here's response. These are all correct trials. So what do you see here? In which period do you see, in general, the most activity in terms of individual action potentials. Which, which period is it? The delay. Right. So in the delay, when the animal is remembering, presumably, this stimulus, because it gets it right at the end, you see huge activity, as if the cell is just keeping that stimulus in mind. Okay. So maybe this cell keeps everything in mind. 
And so when he's, he's performing this trial, this trial, this trial, this trial, that is, when this is the target, you might see the same thing. Is that what we see? Here is this, this trial, here's this trial, this trial, this trial. Is there the same activity in all these different trials, or are they different? Same or different across these different graphs? Are they the same pattern of activity here and in the other graphs, or are they different? different. Sorry? Different. Okay, so how are they different? Yes? Okay, so that's, and she said only one cell spike. This is the same cell oh. measured. That's a very important point. I'm glad you, you uh, uh, said that. Um, so this is the same cell across all these trials for these. Uh, when this was shown, this was shown, this was shown, this. Of course, they were shown in random order, and they just uh, uh, put them, uh, organized them by when this was the target, when this was the target that shown here, when north was the target that was shown here. This is exactly the same cell. Yeah. Exactly. So, so what this graph shows, you need to uh, understand this because I'm going to ask you to interpret these kinds of graphs in the exam. This, this, uh, this individual cell only responds mainly in the delay interval when the animal is remembering the south target, but it's not responding, it's actually not responding any different from fixation period where the animal's doing nothing. That's kind of what's called the baseline <coughs> period. Um, only responds in this directionally selective um, manner, okay? And the fact that you're only responding in the delay interval, remember, there's absolutely nothing on the screen in the delay interval except the fixation point. In fact, the same fixation point is in the, on, on the screen in the delay interval in this in um, these trials, these trials, these trials from delay, these trials from delay, all of these different trials. So you can say, well, is this a sensory stimulus response? Uh, is this a sensory response of, of the cell? The answer is no, because the same exact visual stimulus is not causing the same activity. What seems to be modulating this individual cell is memory for a particular direction, keeping something in mind for a particular direction, okay? So that means that as you go to the next room trying to remember, do I have my sock? Am I going here for my sock? Am I going here for my shirt? You might have individual cells in your prefrontal cortex that are selective for that memory, for the sock. I'm going in for the sock now. I'm going in for the key now. I'm going in for the um, jacket now. So this in this way, this is a directional selective working memory signal. And you could extrapolate that to humans. We could have object selective working memory signals. So you're, at, you're, you're saying, so we start out with this idea, keeping things in mind um, is what the prefrontal cortex does. It's a very important cognitive function. We use it all the time. You're all using it right now. And now we can say, what exactly are these cells doing? They are firing in kind of an information-specific way and maintaining this in mind by saying, OK, I am the south-firing cell, and I'm only going to fire when I have to remember to go south. That's the only time I'm going to uh, fire. That is the signal that the brain is giving you to help you keep things, these things in mind. This is a very simple signal. It's a motor-based signal, but we have uh, lots of things that are kept in working memory. You have, um, uh, you have uh, perhaps uh, the definition of prefrontal cortex in your working memory. That would be helpful for you to keep that in mind to, to um, uh, continue class. That might be represented in your uh, uh, prefrontal cortex right now. Yes? Ah, great question. Is there any other way to figure out whether this cell retains other information besides direction? And the answer is absolutely yes. And the way to do that is you have to train the animal on multiple different tasks. 
And while, the, while you have the cell on the end of your electrode and you're recording from it, you have to do this task and other control tasks to see how selective this is. Um, it, it does the cell that responds to direction also respond to particular pictures? For example, keeping a picture in mind and not a direction in mind. And it turns out that this area that's being, re uh, that's being recorded from is very specific for kind of direction selective motor responses. This is like working memory for actions, right? So you, um, um, what is a good example where you have to wait five seconds before putting your pin code in? So you have to hold back, remember what your pin code is, and put that in. So you're using your working memory to remember that pin code. And uh, um, that, that kind of action, preparing for action, is uh, what this part of the prefrontal cortex does. But the way you answer your question is to design other tasks to, to uh, control for other things this cell might do. Great question. Anything else? Any other questions about this? Does everybody understand? You must understand that this is recording from one prefrontal cell showing something very, very specific that is selective working memory for a particular direction. Okay? So now we know the pattern of activity underlying working memory and the fact that it's highly selective. It's not like Every time anything gets it, it is in mind, the cell is firing. It's firing for memory for particular things. Okay? Okay. And this should remind you from data from a previous lecture. I just want to try and tie it in again, bringing back your medial temporal lobe dependent long term memory. And that is our motor cortex lecture. If you remember, this came directly from the, uh, actually, this one wasn't from the book, but. Um, uh, this is a task in which uh, animals were asked to simply move to different directions, recording in primary motor cortex, and we found cells that were selected for general movement directions, but these cells were different. This cell uh, just started right before the movement started. That was a movement-centered task. This is a, a, a cell that fires, that starts to fire right when the memory comes in mind. This is way before the preparation to the actual response. And in fact, oops, here is uh, uh, trials that go on for, let me see, these are trials that go on for like 15 seconds uh, before the animal has to make his response. And this is an individual uh, prefrontal cell that is maintaining this activity for as long as the animal keeps this thing in mind. Now, this didn't go to the longer extent of the delay not match the sample task, but this is uh, suggests that it, when you keep things in mind, the animal's anticipating it's going to be there, going to be there, um, you can still see this happening, this delay activity happening for a long time. Again, I show this because this is clearly not a motor response. He's not preparing for movement right now. He's keeping this in his working memory. And um, these, these responses, they're similar in their directional selectivity, but they are centered on zero here, which is the uh, initiation of the movement. These are movement-related uh, uh, patterns of spiking from, an, again, individual cell responding to all these different directions. Uh, and uh, that should be, uh, you should understand the difference between that and this working memory signal that we're seeing right here. Any questions about that? Okay, good. Okay, and this was just the, um, this is from the previous chapters, uh, 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 chapter five on motor responses. This is a motor learning uh, um, tuning curve. So this is the selectivity of neurons to an 180 degree movement. We can make the same kind of tuning curve for this neuron. It would be very specific for the south direction. This is, isn't a movement learning curve. This is a working memory um, uh, um, tuning curve. Okay. So uh, just one or two more quick tasks before the end. Um, we spent a lot of time on this one key area of cognition dependent on the prefrontal cortex working memory. We talked about the deficit that you see the deficit you might see in a human. We talked about how 
Phineas Gage's uh, behavior was consistent with this kind of working memory deficit. He couldn't keep a job, couldn't keep things in mind, keep things in order. And, um, uh, um, and then in the monkey, what the neural basis of that was. I want to mention um, this lecture and next lecture, two other tasks that are very prototypical of um, tasks that will be impaired if you have a prefrontal lesion. Of course, our first task is delayed response. The second task is a task of task shifting, a, a shifting task. And the deficit you see in this task tends to be a deficit of perseveration with prefrontal lesions. What is this task? It's a task that you might have heard of before. It's called the Wisconsin hard sort task. And here's how it works. You get different uh, cards like this. And um, you're told at some point that this card is correct. Okay? And you have to figure out what the rule is. It could be all cards with one symbol on it are correct. You match the number. It could be with all the, that all only the cards with this uh, ugly yellow color are correct. It could be that all the cards with circles on it are correct. So it could be a, a, a number rule, a color rule, or a form rule. I don't tell you that. I just say, this is the correct card. Figure out what's correct. And then once you pick this, I'll tell you that's right or that's wrong. Okay? So you figure it out. Let's say it's the form rule. So you pick this when I say correct, and then you start picking all of the circle cards that come up. But then I switch the rule on you, and I switch to the color rule at some point. And then you have to figure out what that is. Okay, so you can imagine that you, you just have to keep, keep uh, uh, these things in mind. You have to uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, look at all these different categories and, um, and categorize things well. This is a classic task where if you have a prefrontal lesion, you do not, you are not switching uh, appropriately. And instead, you end up perseverating over the four or perseverating over the color, even if I tell you that it's now a number uh, uh, match, I, or I, I, I switch the rule to the number, no matter what, you will just keep doing color, 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 okay? And so um, what does this tell us? This tells us that uh, the prefrontal cortex, another one of the cognitive functions, is um, uh, being able to switch attention back and forth to different things. Now, do you think that? is a fundamental function. How many times do you switch your attention from your texting to your lecture to your what you're thinking about, whether you're hungry, it's noon, I want lunch? That is what you do. You, you need to be, you're doing it all the time. And uh, uh, you can do it effectively or not effectively. Uh, I, another kind of task, again, just understand that this task um, is one that's very sensitive to prefrontal lesions. And finally, um, I want to, uh, uh, this task shifting uh, um, task, the Wisconsin hard sorting task, also gets at another general cognitive function that has been attributed to the frontal lobe, and that is the organization of goal-directed behavior. How do you organize your, your, um, uh, your ability to do things? If you're given a recipe to follow, you, there's actually a specific order to do uh, to do it, or else it completely comes out wrong. People with prefrontal lesions have a very difficult time following a recipe. They can read it, they can understand it, they can even memorize it, but to be able to do it in a logical way is very, very difficult. And that is a, a good example of what people have come to describe as executive function, organization of goal behavior, related behavior. And one aspect, particularly that, that is relevant in the recipe kind of example, is temporal order memory. You need to not just remember what order to do it in, but to do uh, that particular order. And it turns out that uh, both being able to enact things in a logical order and to be able to remember temporal order is something that patients with prefrontal lesions have severe impairments on. So here is a task where um, you can give, imagine a whole bunch of line drawings of normal everyday objects. And I'm just going to show you them one at a time first. 
So I'm going to show you a lamp, I'm going to show you a table, I'm going to show you a chair, I'm going to show you a bird, I'm going to show you a cat, I'm going to show you a car. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to now show you a card like this or a screen like this. And I'm going to have two of these objects. And sometimes uh, um, one of them will be, uh, one of them will have been on the list and one of them will not. And uh, I'll ask you, uh, which one have you seen before? And sometimes both objects will have been on the list before, and I'll ask you, which one did you see first? Patients with prefrontal lesions have uh, uh, severe impairments at memory for temporal order, but not memory for the objects themselves. They can remember what objects they saw. They just can't tell you what order it was in. Why? Because this executive function is helping you keep things in mind, keep things in order. Patients with prefrontal lesions have a hard time telling a story. They can't tell a joke at all. Why? Because in a joke, timing is critical. You have to tell the buildup and then give the punchline. And you know they're they're exuberant, so they tend to tell you the punchline, and then nobody nobody laughs at all. Um, so that's another terrible deficit of having prefrontal lesions. But also illustrates uh, the um, uh, the the critical aspect of timing in prefrontal function. Uh, so yeah, so here's the, the finding lesions of dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, that same area important for working memory, produce a selective impairment on the recency task, that is the recognition memory task, but not the item recognition memory task. And uh, we'll end there. Um, and uh, I will see you all next.